by VTL to roll tape for Conde One. Since 1963, television news has recorded the most significant moments of Singapore's history. Will your mind ever stop for a while? These images have become part of our collective memory. The first flats were ready. The families, which had once lived in slums, now had private entrances. With that smile, windows, we dreamed a common dream yes. of a new way of life. At 11.30, according to eyewitnesses, it crumbled like a pack of cards. With those words, a nation was stunned. on the first MRC train. And with that announcement, we sped into a new era of travel. August the 9th, 1966. 50 years on, we're here to bring back the magic of some of television's most iconic moments. We waited so long for this day. And reunite with Singaporeans who were there with us. These are their stories. Our stories of the last 50 years. Hi, I'm Wee Sun Hui. 30 years ago, I made the news. Some of you may remember me as Mrs. Tay from Channel 5's long-running series, Growing Up. Few of you may remember me as the presenter of Friday Background, a current affairs programme. Tonight, as SBC celebrates its fourth anniversary, in the 1980s, I was a newsreader. Whether taking part in these celebrations in the short space of four years, he was the man, people... And now, what a wonderful time to be back on screen as we celebrate 50 years of television and its most significant news moments. What was your most memorable TV moment? Everyone will recall their own special moments and they probably differ from generation to generation. But no matter how or where you watched it, there's no question, TV shapes our culture. As we celebrate the 50 years of TV news, we remember those who made the news with us. Let's go back to when it all started, 15 February 1963. Here at the Victoria Memorial Hall, where a few hundred people had gathered, something big was about to happen. Okay, everybody, please stand by. Ten seconds to go. Stand by VTR to roll tape for Condi One. It was almost 6 p.m. Apart from the VIPs gathered here, ordinary Singaporeans had assembled at 52 community centres and 2,400 homes across the island. They were about to witness the debut of television in Singapore. VTR, roll tape for Conti One. Tonight, Television Singapura begins transmission with a mother's pilot service. And tonight might well mark the start of a social and cultural revolution in our lives. The first images to burst on screen were scenes like these. Images of Everyday Singapore. It was a 15-minute documentary called TV Looks at Singapore. You know, the old folks were there, the children. They were making a lot of noise, and especially the children, they were very excited. So I think it is a good experience for them. They, they got the first glimpse, you know, of images on the screen. The first newsreel lasted all of five minutes. The entire broadcast, just under two hours. The PAP emerged but TV was here to stay. The politicians of the day realised that TV had the power to help them reach out to the electorate. You know, we faced the ultimate when we decided to fight the communists. We've got enough gumption in us. Having decided to take our lives in our own hands and fight for what we believe it is right, I say, well, fight to the end. TV was launched 
our then Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, realized the importance of television. Here is a media he can use to convince the people of what is good for them. If you want us to be the government, then hold for that symbol. Ready on one, camera one. Can you please dolly in? Very slowly. But the most popular programs were variety shows like these. The early news bulletins were straightforward affairs. No fancy graphics, no cross-border microwave link-ups. Apart from the news bulletins, there were also current affairs programs. Today, I wish to discuss with you the importance of antenatal care. So, if you obey the law, you don't have to worry about these radar eyes. The television gave you information more than just facts. It was really something that had a direct impact on the person, shaped the person's thinking, views, attitudes, and even emotionally touched him. On 9th August 1965, Singaporeans were about to find out just how deeply television could touch them. Go Ki Chai was at that time a 22-year-old vision mixer with a television station. Ki Chai was told the night before that there was going to be a news conference. I realised that uh, it was a very important programme because in the morning, we saw that there are so many journalists and uh, reporters all congregating in the studio floor. On this moment, when we signed this agreement which severed Singapore from Malaysia, it will be a moment of anguish. I mean, for me, it is a moment of anguish because all my life, Uh, I think there was a lot of confusion. Uh, all of us were actually waiting for, to see what we should do next. You see, the whole of my adult life... I, as a young producer, school is the best traditions and rules about what to do when you see a distressing scene. And the rules simply say, go away from that scene. But in this instance, I went contrary to the instructions. I told the cameraman to hold the close-up as long as we could. I had believed in Malaysia in merger and the unity of these two territories. How do you feel watching this now again? It brings me back and we also made the right decision, I think, to actually capture it on camera before uh, it gets faded off. Would you mind if we stop for a while? <laughs> if you were a viewer from that era, you would have remembered vividly the moment you were told we had to stand on our own. Our future was uncertain. The economic uncertainties were compounded by strikes and social unrest in the form of communist agitation and communal violence. It would take a miracle for Singapore to survive, let alone flourish. Survive we did, and Singapore needed to celebrate in a big way. For it was on that day, one year previously, that Singapore had assumed her independent and sovereign status upon separation from Malaysia. So the cameras were all out 
for Singapore's first birthday bash. The National Day Parade, held at the Padang, was the first big event to be broadcast on national television. We want to show people that, you know, we were happy. Uh, happy in the sense that, you know, we survived the first year of our nationhood. The marching columns were led by the Guard of Honour from the 1st Battalion, the Singapore Infantry Regiment. Participants of the parade had less than 50 days to put it together. TV crews had to find the best vantage points. There was no such thing as tickets. Those who wanted to catch the parade had to turn up two hours earlier for a good seat. 160 men from the Singapore Naval Volunteers Reserve. The flags the boys carried were red and white, the colours of the Republic of Singapore. The Red Cross contingent had about 200 people. And in it was a young teenager, 13-year-old Tang Chun Tuck. Were you wearing something similar to this on the first National Day Parade? Yes, it's my proud uniform. Tang, who's now 59, wasn't even supposed to march that day. He was a reserve participant, but even then, he faithfully attended all the rehearsals. So when two other members dropped out just before the parade, Tang was one of the two cadets chosen to replace them. When your contingent was moving down South Ridge Road, can you remember what you saw, what you heard? The time I was looking forward, looking to the front as I marched, but I can see from the corners of my eyes, people are waiting at the level two, level three of the shop houses, waiting for us to come and welcoming us and cheering up. And we even see a lot of people line up the street, also applauding us. And your family members, were they, were they around? Were they lining the street to watch you? After the live broadcast, we quickly rushed to the street to join the crowd to witness the passing of my continue. How did it feel watching yourself on TV? Oh, well, I must say it was a spectacular experience. The whole place here is like a birthday cake. It's like the first birthday of Singapore being celebrated by all Singaporeans. That experience spurred me on to participate in subsequent National Day parades. After the excitement of the first National Day parade, Singapore embarked on a rapid industrialization program and speeded up her urban renewal. Unpopular policies had to be introduced, policies like national service. Every boy and girl will learn what it is to be a citizen, what it is to defend this country. And relocation to public housing. Television had to help clarify the policies to the man on the street. In Singapore, I think television has played a very important role in, in the political education of the people. Arguably, in the past, it had to play a bigger role because the political education was more urgent. Remember this lady and her smile? She has become a television icon representing the joys of public housing. Where is she now? If you were living in Singapore in the 1960s, this is probably where you'll be in the evenings. At a community centre watching your favourite drama serial. Every centre had one television set sponsored by the government. A high-end black and white TV set from Germany cost about 2,400 Singapore dollars in those days about what a news editor would earn in three months. If you are privileged to have a TV set in your house, at about now, which is 7 or 8 p.m. in the evening, your neighbours would find their way into your house to watch their favourite shows. The regular fare was Chinese drama serials and foreign programmes like Bewitched and Cartoons, and it's through moments like these that the Kampung spirit was forged. In the Kampungs, there would be about a dozen or so families living in ground-level wooden houses. But 
as the population grew, slums mushroomed. Tarpaya has been the home of thousands of squatters for many years. These shelters of atta, wood and old scrap materials disfigure Singapore. It was during the housing crisis in 1960 that the Housing Development Board, or HDB, was tasked to build public flats quickly. We must rebuild our city, said Prime Minister Leet. He said the time had come to mount a direct assault on the squalor and congestion of the slums. So the huge slum, which was once Tupayo, became the first satellite town solely built by HDB. All 54,000 flats were built in the space of five years. But it wasn't easy getting the kampong folks to move to the high-rise apartments. For one, they had to give up their farming activities in the backyards. They also had to learn to take the lift. So programs like these were made. Many Atap dwellers of Toapayo who were misled about the government's intentions were reluctant to move. And now they've suddenly changed. And this is a feature called Spotlight on Housing. It was done to promote living in HDB flats. Compensation for fruit trees and other crops. The families, which had once lived in slums, now had private entrances, glass windows, piped water, gas and electricity. Many Singaporeans have come to know her as the HDB lady. Her obvious excitement captured on film has for years been used to highlight the joys of living in these new flats. But who is she? And where is she now? Does she realise she's become an icon of sorts? We began our hunt for the HDB lady three months ago. We started our search in Tupayo thinking that she must live in one of the oldest blocks there. But after knocking on numerous doors with no result, we asked for your help. And called out on social media, For weeks, we heard nothing. We were close to giving up. Until this. The photos confirmed that our search was over. This is you? Yes, it's me. Ah, good hair. Yes, it's me. Ah. When you saw this straight over and over and over again, how did you feel? Why are you? And your friends, when they saw it on TV, did they say anything to you? This was actually filmed when Madame Teo was only 24, and the boy she was carrying is Roger, her son, who was only two then. This wasn't a flat in Teopayo. It was at Kim Tian Road, and it was Madame Teo's uncle's flat. She was going to move in temporarily because her attic house burnt down in the 1961 Bukit Hosri fire. Today, she and her family still live in public housing in this four-room Woodlands flat. We wouldn't have found Madame Teo if not for her grandson, Jun Tai, who responded to our call for action. After so many years, I was quite excited and I wanted to, to let everyone know that actually that was my grandmother That's and she is still with us. And what did she say? Oh, very happy. Very happy. She's been waiting for today to come. <laughs> <laughs> so there are four generations of you, including you living together uh, in HDB flats. Was there any TV campaigns that sort of imprinted on your mind that makes you want to live in HDB and bring all your children up in HDB flats? I remember that they have a uh, own, uh, own house uh, and live in one roof. Right. Everybody that have a, 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 home, a home. Ha 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 ha! 
In the 1970s, the novelty of black and white television was starting to wear off. In 1974, colour TVs were introduced. This was the first live colour telecast via satellite, the World Cup soccer final between West Germany and Holland. And we have the most dramatic start in the history of World Cup finals. Some 2,000 colour TV sets were sold three days before the match. Soccer fever was officially on. The goal that puts his team in front in the World Cup final. I was told on the night of 7 July 1974, Singapore streets were unusually deserted and the cinemas empty. <laughs> Television helped give rise to the Malaysia Cup fever, an annual soccer tournament held in Malaysia. Colour TV would capture vividly the rivalry between Singapore and Malaysian soccer teams. In those days, Kwa Kim Song was nicknamed Mercurial Speed Demon by his fans. Well, the, the impact was tremendous because uh, those people that could not travel and so on could still watch Singapore play on TV. I was told by my friends and so on that when we scored a goal, you can hear the thunderous uh, cheers and applause from across the, the heartlands here. 62-year-old Kwa Kim Song played an instrumental role in Singapore clinching the Malaysia Cup in 1977. It was the Lions' first cup victory in 12 long years. When I watched the replays and so on, I felt nostalgic. You go onto the streets or you meet people, you know, they will still reminisce you know, over the old Malaysia Cup days. You know. Good feeling. As the 80s approached with more advanced filming technology, demand for faster news delivery also went up. The speed and accuracy of a young news station was about to be put to the test by two of Singapore's worst civil disasters. From tomorrow, Radio and Television Singapore will become the Singapore Broadcasting Corporation. With the change, the SBC will take over all the functions of RTS. It was in 1980 that Radio and Television Singapore, or RTS, became Singapore Broadcasting Corporation, SBC. SBC was to be a statutory board with greater autonomy. The station set about attracting more talent and expanding its services. Duncan Watt was hired as a newsreader in 1980. When I first started, it was absolutely terrifying. I'd never been so nervous in all my life. You'd come down to a studio and there'd be cameras all around you with people operating them in those days and there'd be someone operating flip charts on one side, all the photographs and the weather forecast, all the individual pictures would have to be flipped. And I was so nervous because I knew that over there, through the camera, there were maybe a million people watching me. The introduction of electronic video equipment in 1980 allowed for quicker editing. Okay, has arrived. The show has started. Once the pictures have been recorded, they're sent back to SBC via microwave. Central operators to ENG, can you rotate to record satellite news feature? So television news was able to bring the agony of national tragedies more dramatically into every home. Two cable cars fell into the sea between Jardin Steps and Sentosa this evening. The incident happened at around 6 p.m. On 29 June 1983, as they tune into their television sets, Singaporeans held their breaths together. The tower of an oil drilling vessel had snagged the cableway, causing two occupied cable cars at Sentosa to plunge into the sea. Another 13 people were trapped in mid-air in four other cable cars, which stopped. <laughs> Lian San was a cup reporter then. He was one of the first reporters notified by the police and headed straight 
for the disaster zone. Rescue operations are going on to rescue another 18 people who are trapped in at least four cable cars dangling between Mount Faber and Sentosa. Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong was then the chief of staff of the Singapore Armed Forces, who was in charge of the overall rescue operation. In brief, the helicopter would have had to fly overhead, hover, lower a man on a winch, accurately alongside the cable car. Uh, and he would then bring out the passengers one at a time. For eight hours, as viewers waited with bated breath, helicopters battled high wind conditions to rescue stranded passengers while army frogmen rushed to the scene and combed the water for bodies. I remember when Seven people were killed in the cable car tragedy. Thirteen were rescued. We are proud of the troops, the pilots and the crewmen who were involved and whose performance made possible the success of the plan. In moments like these, TV brought grief and finally relief into thousands of homes. It united people in a shared humanity. Three years later, Singaporeans experienced another emotional roller coaster together. At 11 o'clock, this was a seven-story hotel. At 11.30, according to eyewitnesses, it crumbled like a pack of cards. The building collapsing like a pack of cards. Uh, that stayed with me, and that, to me, was an iconic moment in time. The situation was precarious. The priority, to save the lives of the people who had been imprisoned for so long. Ross Mawati was then a senior reporter with the station. She had helped to coordinate the entire coverage. It was just the start of uh, my shift, and at about 11.30, uh, I got a call from an off-duty reporter who told me that his contacts alerted him to the fact that a building um, in uh, Serangoon Road had just collapsed. 15th March, 1986. The day of the Hotel New World collapse. Nothing like this had ever happened before. The public was stunned. A TV crew was promptly dispatched and they quickly set up a reporting unit to file live reports from the scene. Broken a hole through, it's just a small one. Round the clock, the crew worked, filing reports in four official languages. Looking furiously to clear the road. San stayed on site for seven nights doing interview after interview. As I said, I do not know exactly what happened, whether it's structural design or is I do not know. We would like to bring the pictures live, we would like to bring reports live, uh, we would like to have live actualities so that it can bring home to people watching television. 
At 11.55, more than 36 hours after the collapse of the six-story building in Sarangoon Road, two survivors, the total now 11. Our priority now is to mount a systematic rescue operation. At that time, one of the biggest challenges of the operation was trying to get the survivors out alive. The rescuers only had simple tools like crowbars and levers to help them, unlike the sophisticated equipment available today. We wanted to look for one of the rescuers who was there that day. How did they manage to work through the rubble without the help of modern equipment? We want you. Ramla Dola was the first to respond. The then 24-year-old was a fireman with the Singapore Fire Brigade. He wasn't even mobilized to carry out rescue work that day, but he was one of the first to rush to the scene. I can see many passerby. I know their intention is good, you know. Climbing up the building, you know, on top of the building, you know, many of them on top. So when I see this situation, I quickly felt that this is not safe. My instinct, uh, I cannot do this side, you know, I cannot follow them. I must go surrounding the, the, the building where the, what, what the mouse is always doing, oh, yes. uh, looking for uh, holes, you know. So that, that's where I, I, I go around the building where I located a fan duct. So we move in from there. To get in, Ramlan pried open the fan duct with a crowbar and a lever. We saw uh, uh, many cars, wreckage cars, you know, so we can't crawl. Okay, we, we just like uh, uh, moving sideways, then uh, on top of the cars, go underneath, you know. The story of those who were saved has a happy ending despite the ordeal. But there are those who have lost their lives. The final count of the tragedy is 33 bodies recovered and 17 lives saved. The whole area has been cleared and rescue work is now ending. The event itself is so huge that you tend to forget yourself. You just get sucked into it. Uh, it doesn't call for any heroism. It doesn't call for any uh, super strength or stamina. It just You're just there because you're sucked in by the atmosphere and you just continue to report as everybody else, the camera crew, the, the technical crew, the firemen, the people saving, everybody just doesn't stop. It just goes on and on and on. It was sad sometimes when we showed, you know, bodies being taken away. But there were also moments of joy when we showed um, people being rescued. So, so after some time, we realised that, hey, the coverage must be about what really is happening. It's not just a question of how many died. You know, but more a question of how many people were saved, how many lives were saved, and, and each of them had a story to tell. While TV brought us news we dreaded, it also brought us news that made us smile. Then we wanted to be the first couple to be on the MRT. bulletin you need the news and in the 1980s there was no lack of it those were the years of great tragedies like the hotel new world collapse and the cable car accident but they were also the years of great triumphs for the little nation it's finally here the mass rapid transit system got off to a roaring start today the trains are ready to go on 7th November 1987, Singaporeans witnessed the launch of the country's largest infrastructure project to date. Government has now taken a firm decision to build the MRT. About 120,000 people turned up that day to queue and take the first train. Well, here we are on the first MRT train, the first batch of passengers, and yes, we're off. 
You may not have been on that first train ride, but about 20 of our reporters were there. Now, many of these tunnels would people move around. And it's taken Singapore into a new era of transportation. Documenting that first look into the train interiors. The excitement of the first ride. But did you know that the first train ride lasted only five stations and a grand total of 10 minutes? More than 500 VIPs were invited that day, and amongst them was this very special couple. Most couples would choose either the Botanic Gardens or the Chinese Gardens. Why do you choose the MRT? <laughs> Well, because it's very special. I mean, it's really we a special... We want it to be special, and we want it to be the first couple to be on the MRT. A special occasion. Special. You made it as the yeah. first couple. All the best here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Years later, even as the MRT has grown from just five stations to 99 stations, many still remember the couple who tied the knot on the train. We set out to find the couple who added so much to our memory of that news event. We started with the Registry of Marriages. There were 200 couples who got hitched that day. It would take us two months of searching before, finally, one simple line. Was this really the couple we were looking for? Mr. Lim? Yeah. Hi, this is Lim. I'm Sun Hui from CNA. Did you, uh, by any chance, get married on the first MRT train ride in 1987? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you did? Yes, yes. yes. Can, can I come in? I've been searching for you for so long. Sure, 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 sure. sure. Yeah. Really, really made the news. Huh? Yeah. Oh, you even have a ticket. This shot is very iconic. It's being used on all the footages, and you can see now. You know, when we're trying to look for you, it's, it's, it's sort yeah. of that. Was it planned or was it spontaneous? <laughs> I, I couldn't remember. That was so so long time ago. It wasn't planned. Huh? It was a moment of pure serendipity. One of the drivers of their wedding brigade had told the couple about the MRT launch. Mr. Lim decided to join in the festivities. Until the recent publicity blitz on Channel News Asia, the couple had never seen the actual news clip. Interview us. Oh, oh yeah, this is yeah. <laughs> Spontaneous. Uh, <laughs> so how do you feel making the news then and making the news now? What? Actually, we don't expect to you all to find us back again, you know, after so many years. Huh? Yeah. We actually were shocked. Lah. So mm. my cousin said, oh, you two are going to be a star already. <laughs> <laughs> Today, the happy couple are proud parents of a 13-year-old, Davis. Their son takes the MRT regularly, but for them, it's been 26 years since that special ride. How has it changed since the first train ride and the only train ride you've ever had? It's much improved, yeah. It's more comfortable now, yeah. Definitely, just probably then, you know, it's very crowded. Maybe today's ride is lesser people, so it's more comfortable. Yeah. And they say I'm more colourful. More colourful, <laughs> is it? 26 years later, what is your feeling now riding this train? Together with all the camera crew around you, the way the camera crew was, uh, the TV crew was around you then? Frankly, uh, it's just like, you know, walking down uh, memory lane, you know, uh, uh, you know it's like... It's then, just like then, six yeah. years ago, we get married with all the other... So <laughs> did you see your parents' footage yeah. on TV? Yeah, I saw them. How did you feel watching them? They look like stars. Yeah. <laughs> you want to go back and relive old memories and give her a kiss yeah. again? I don't mind. <laughs> I feel great and very happy there to be uh, the first to lead the service. The master control key is now handed over to the train driver, Kung Mao Sui. Mr and Mrs Lim weren't the only ones who made the news that day. Frankie too, as the pioneer MRT train operator. 
ministers in I'm Mexico waiting at the near the stage. From the looks of it, all six carriages <laughs> are full and the atmosphere is charged with excitement, not just for yes. the 120,000 people who are undertaking today's journey, but also for Mr. Hun, the train operator. <laughs> That's you again. <laughs> the start of the train. This is when in the auto, this will train will run by itself. Mm. You still remember it very well, huh? Yeah, I do. Your face has gone a little red <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is the first time that I see myself on TV. And, and it's so long, it's a very, very uh, touching feeling to see that again. Since the day he made the news, Frankie has spent the next decade operating trains on the North-South Line and later as a crew manager. Frankie left SMRT in 2011 to spend more time on his archery hobby. I can still remember the moment of excitement when you were driving that first train going into Uchu Kang. Can you recall all that? <laughs> it was very touching. Being at the right place at the right time, that's often what making the news is all about. And for one cameraman, that was how he landed one of the most stunning rescue shots of a hijack. You were probably about to fall asleep on the night of March 26, 1991, just when news of an SIA hijack had reached the television newsroom. On March 27th, Singaporeans woke up to the shocking news that an SIA Airbus had been hijacked. Flight SQ-117 was taken over by four Pakistani terrorists. 114 passengers were on board. Rosmawati was the editor coordinating the coverage of that hijack. She and her team were told of a strict embargo. It was like in the movies, only that it was real. We were waiting for things to happen, but nothing was happening because um, the authorities were making sure that uh, nothing would jeopardize uh, negotiations. Cameraman Amin heard about the incident and volunteered for this assignment. Amin and all other media were told to report to the police quarters and to stay there until further instructions but Armin defied orders. For me, cameraman, you know, first important thing is the visual. The visual of the aircraft, you know? So if I confine myself at a police station, that's why I don't do the job. So I rushed out. And we know that other, other local journalists, photographers all around, you know, whispering. Right? So we know that they're also trying to get the picture. So from then on, I move. Amin spent about two to three hours circling the airport, looking for a vantage point. It wasn't until four in the morning that he finally found his spot. That's the spot, about one and a half to two kilometer. From there, I moved to this part. Airport police station. I was at a perfect target, and my target, the plane, is right in front of me. Rasmawati and her team of reporters were still on standby in the newsroom. They were told to break the story only after the rescue. To us, it was like taking forever. And then I recalled just close to daybreak. It was around close to 6 o'clock in the morning, I think. That's action. By training his camera at the same point for over two hours, the result is a recording of how the SAF elite forces stormed the plane. After eight hours of unsuccessful negotiations, SAF commandos stormed the plane and shot dead the four gunmen. All the hostages were freed. Oh, at the end of the day, I look at the footage. Huh? Oh, that's history, man. I grabbed the shot. That was the one and only time a Singapore Airlines plane was hijacked and television was there 
to capture the rescue. If the SIA hijack caught the world's attention, the foiling of it cemented Singapore's reputation as having a very capable SAF elite team. Merdeka. Merdeka. For the last 50 years, television has been there. And as the nation has grown, so too has television. And as Singaporeans watched the same historic events unfold, collectively we laughed, cried, cheered and imagined. Singapore! And it is moments like these where you have uh, intense moments of fear. So you're doing your best. Intense moments of excitement, intense moments of you really don't know what's going to happen. I think news uh, is a very, very important part of the education of the people. The way people consume the news in Singapore has changed more in the last five years than in the previous 50. In this era of Instagram and 20-second sound bites, some of you may get your news from Facebook or Twitter. Now you can also watch the news anywhere, anytime. The way we consume news may have changed, but some things remain the same. It's on Channel News Asia. We still want to be informed and to make sense of the world we live in. For 50 years, television was there for the country's most significant historical events. TV has been a big part of my life and yours. And I'll not be watching TV for a long time yet.